Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Dark Matter Knits podcast. I'm Elizabeth Green Musselman, and it is April 25th, 2015. Hello. Today's topic, oh, it's episode 30, and we're calling it Close to My Heart because of several things we're going to talk about today. I am trying to keep the thematic thing going. It has proven more challenging as time goes on, but today, today, I think I've got it. Um... Some announcements before we get going. Some kind of, what have I been doing this week? Stuff I got to tell you kind of things. One of them is, uh, again, I have a very generous donation to say thank you for. And um, sometimes people want me to say their names and sometimes people don't. And in this case, she wanted to stay anonymous. Um, But asked me to tell you And I thought this was a really lovely sentiment. It is my hope that others will be inspired to encourage creative entrepreneurism in whatever way they choose. Which is a really great way of putting it. I entirely mean podcast donations to be completely voluntary. I make it available because people ask me about it. Some people want to be able to do it, which is great. I do not expect it. But I think the, the general concept that this person put into words of supporting the creative people in your life in your life that um, whose work you really appreciate I think is is a really great that's just a great way to put it and I try to do that too so it uh, it just it, you know it kind of made me feel like we're all in this together you know like we're all we're all supporting each other in our creative endeavors which I thought was it just made me feel really good. So thank you. Um, we also, we have a giveaway to wrap up from last time, the Pattern Genius app, uh, which was the chart making app that, uh, that I showed you last time. And the giveaway was for a one year subscription. So this, this app is, it's not a one time purchase. It's actually a subscription because the, the app is regularly updated and it's, um, well, it's a fairly niche app. So it, uh, it's on a, on a subscription basis, sort of like a magazine. Um, so it's for a one-year subscription, and our winner is number four, who is Piney River Pearl, Patricia. And I'm sure she's going to be very excited about this because she sounded really excited about the app. And, uh, and she says that she really wants to design her own lace shawls, which, again, made me really happy that she... I mean, I, I would have been happy if any of you had won, but it's just really nice when you see that somebody is really, really into something and they're going to win it. So congratulations, Patricia. I'm glad that you get to uh, get to try this out and uh, and do let us know what you think about it once you've had a chance to to give it a go. And, um, and also let us know if you do design a lace shawl because I would really like to see it. That actually reminds me to tell you, uh, I don't know if everybody's seen this, but in the Ravelry group, there is a place where you can show off things that you have well, there are actually several threads where you can show off things that you've made. I've got one if you've, uh, if you're knitting one of my designs, and there's also one where if you have come up, come out with something that you want people to see, like you make project bags, or you dye yarn, or you've designed a pattern, or you know anything that's. It actually doesn't even need to be knitting related. If you've written a book or an article that you think people might be interested in, whatever it is. Uh, just, or if you've, you know, got, got a podcast of your own that you'd like people to see, whatever it is, there's a a thread in there called show us your wares and you're welcome to, to post about that there. Um, I also want, while I'm talking about pattern genius, I wanted to, I said something about this in the thread, but I wanted to say this here too, that I actually made a mistake in my review of the app. Um, when I looked more closely at Remember I said last time that the that there were a limited number of cable options in the chart key? That's actually, well, I'm sure there are a limited number. I'm sure there are not an infinite number of, of uh, cable symbols, but there were a lot more than I realized. Um, once you start digging into the, the cables that are there, you'll see that there are submenus within the cables, and there are actually quite a few in there. So... Uh, I just wanted to correct that statement. Uh, the cable in the free app, there are actually lots of cables. Um, so what do we have to talk about today? 
I'll just tell you a little bit about what I've been up to. I've got what I've been knitting on and some things that I finished. And I have a collection to show you that uh, will also be available as a giveaway. And I have a question to answer that has to do with um, a skein that is near and dear to my heart, or that says a lot about me. And I will also have a technique segment for you at the end, so plenty to talk about. And I need to do it fairly quickly because one of my former colleagues, um, I used to teach history, one of the other history professors up at the school where I used to teach just got tenure, so, and she's a good friend of mine, so we're having her over for, her and her husband over for dinner tonight to, to celebrate. So I gotta go bake dinner and clean the house. <laughs> it's fine. It's totally fine. It'll all happen. <sighs> I'm just a little behind because uh, this morning, um, I'm finding that I'm having less and less time during the work week to, to record, so it's more and more it's happening on Saturdays. And this morning, we went, my son's school has been doing a fundraiser for a organization called Walk for Water that uh, basically has schools raise money for schools in developing countries where uh, the school, the elementary schools there may not have uh, water. So sometimes they'll dig, you know, raise money to dig a well, or in this case, it was to build a rain catchment system, which is very cool. And this school is in uh, Congo, in Central Africa. So, um, they were trying to raise $2,500 to send to the school so they could build this rain catchment system. And, uh, and they always, every year, the fifth grade social studies teacher organizes this whole thing, and it's really cool. And uh, they usually get, you know, right up close to their goal, and then the last part of the fundraising effort is they do a six-kilometer walk around uh, what's called Town Lake in Austin. It's actually a section of the Colorado River. There's a nice hike and bike trail around it. So they do a 6K walk around that carrying six liters of water, which is uh, you know, about what a kid would carry back and forth from a water source. And it's, well, it's, how long, it's how far and how much water a kid at this school would have to carry water from the school, from the water source to the school. I don't know why that was so hard to explain. And, and it's you know, designed to kind of give the kids an idea of you know, just what kind of privileges they have and how, you know, the kinds of stuff that they take for granted. And it was hard. I mean, it was really hot and humid today. In fact, I think Liam got a bit of a heat exhaustion. Um, and six liters of water is a lot. I mean, it was, um, he had a gallon of, like a milk gallon, basically, and that was about a liter and a half. No, it was more than that. But basically, he had that and then like a whole backpack full of water and he was he was kind of struggling about three miles in and uh it, probably exacerbated by the fact that the assistant teacher who is a you know a ut university of texas student kept challenging him to running races <laughs> i'm just like what are you guys doing it's like 88 degrees and humid out here and you're running with 20 pounds of water on your back yes this makes sense so we get about halfway through the walk and the social studies teacher gets a call on the phone and it turns out that her car and two of the other parents' cars have been towed out of the, wait for it, Hooters parking lot where they decided to park. <laughs> for those of you who are not Americans and have been spared the ignominy of Hooters, it is a it is basically a soft porn restaurant where you can go and have women in very tight clothing serve you food. Hooters is a polite or not an impolite term for your memory glands. So for whatever reason they decided that parking in the Hooters parking lot downtown was a good idea and their cars got towed. So we all had to go home early and the PE teacher and I got to wait for an hour and a half in the school parking lot for all the parents to come pick them up early. Yeah, it was a great morning. <laughs> so that's what I've been up to. 
Also went to see a physical therapist. Finally this week I've had back problems for about a decade. Kid you not. And uh, finally went to see a physical therapist about it and it is helping tremendously. Hmm, how about that? Anyways, let's talk about knitting, shall we? Here's what I've been knitting. Remember the honey cow? Oh gosh, it is still so blown out. It's much greener than this. This is, and not fluorescent. Mm, no, it's just not gonna, not gonna look right. Uh, this is a, a yarn that I believe is no longer being dyed. White Bear Fibers, and it is their sport weight. It looks really great. It is a honey cowl. And it is probably, it's just long enough that you can double it up and wear it snugly around the neck. And uh, otherwise can be worn, you know, kind of necklace-like. Um, I had enough yarn left over that I was just able to eke out a hat with the same stitch pattern and then just a one-by-one one rib on the bottom. I didn't really follow a pattern, I just wung it. I don't think that's the past tense of wing. Winged it? I like wung it better. Just kind of like, it's got a little bit of onomatopoeia to it, you know? Like wung it, I just wung. So these, I actually really like them, um, but I think I am going to hang on to them as a present for probably my sister. I don't think she watches the podcast. My mom does typically, but I think that will stay a surprise even if I mention it on the podcast. Um, so yeah, that is one thing I was knitting. And then, because I finished that not long after I saw you, I decided to work on something else. And I know that I said I was going to do something more complex, but honestly, I have so much design knitting to work on right now that I just, like, the uh, the only other thing I want to knit is something where I don't have to think about it. Because that's the only, the, the only time that I have to knit is either time when I'm working on designs, when I need to concentrate on it, and then if I have time when I can knit but I can't concentrate, that's when I can work on leisure knitting, right? So I decided to cast on with my, sorry, a little tangled up over here on this part of my desk. You may recall that I bought a skein of Yowza by Miss Babs at uh, Dallas DFW Fiberfest, And I decided to cast on, now you would think, because I'm a podcaster and I have a skein of Yowza that I was going to cast on Susan B. Anderson's Yowza Way It Shall, which granted I was tempted to do because I do like it. Uh, well, there are three of them actually, three maybe even four versions of it now. It's a, it's a great shawl and I love, Susan has a great knack for designing stuff that is really simple to knit, but that is really well designed and fun to, to do. So I was tempted, but honestly, um, I have this perverse streak where if everybody else is doing it, I'm like, I can't do it. Which is funny because <laughs> did, I, did I or did I not just knit a honey cowl? But see, that is what everybody was knitting like five years ago. <laughs> so now it's okay. Everybody's knitting away a shawl now. I can't knit that now because I am a contrarian. So this is what I am knitting. It has nothing to do with, I, it has nothing to do with Susan's pattern. I just, you know, got to knit something different. So I'm knitting this, which is also it's in a similar vein. It is a simple garter stitch shawl that is crescent shaped, which means that it um, it increases, there, there are more increases faster. So instead of a triangular shawl where uh, I think it's four increases every other row is kind of the standard triangular shawl. Don't quote me on that, but I think that's right. Uh, I don't, I don't understand shawl design. <laughs> I'm going to mess this up and you're going to believe me and then it's all just going to go to pot. So let's just forget I ever said anything about increases. Anyways, crescent shawls are shallow. They are, you know, shallower this way and grow faster this way. 
So this one is, it's a symmetrical shawl, and it is garter stitch until you get to a lace border. And this is a worsted weight yarn, so it is quite, it gets quite big, and it is, um, and the shawl, the lace pattern, you know, has kind of a chunky look to it because it's not done in a fingering or, or lace weight yarn. So it looks like this. Sorry, I'm trying to, got pokey pokey internet today. Google Fiber is in Austin, but they haven't gotten to our neighborhood yet, much to my chagrin. All right, so this is what it, oh, come on, glass, stop reflecting on my glass. <laughs> there we go. So it has this kind of nice leaf lace pattern to it, and I'm about, um, I don't know, maybe about an inch, inch and a half into that lace part. So I have a little ways to go. Uh, but yeah, it's nice and long. I mean, I, I didn't check gauge, but uh, in the pattern, it's a 60 inch wingspan and 14 and a half inches deep. Oh, perhaps you would like to know what it's called. <laughs> it's called the Ka'ana Shawlette. I'm thinking that's a Hawaiian word, and that's how you say it, Ka'ana Shawlette by Jennifer Wiseman. And it's really lovely. It's been made a lot of times. It's 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 not like I'm just discovering this pattern or anything. It came out about three years ago, and it's uh, there are 504 projects on Ravelry, so it's it's been well tested. Uh, it uses about 600 yards of of yarn. This skein only has about 550 yards, so I'm kind of <laughs> playing with playing with fire here, but I. Most designers tend to add about a 10% wiggle room on, so I'm thinking it'll be fine. And if it's not, whatever. I will just finish it out with a solid color that coordinates. I don't care. <laughs> I just don't. I just like to knit. I'm not a clothes horse. I am not fashionable by any stretch of the imagination. I just like to knit. So that's what I'm working on. It's on, uh, I'm knitting it on size seven needles, I believe. Is that right? No eights, no sevens. 4.5 millimeter and uh, I'm really loving, I got a, recently got a set of, um, what are these called, carbons, interchangeable needles. And uh, yeah, I really, really like them. They're grippier. When, when you need something grippier than uh, than metal, but you still like metal, these are for you. And uh, they have that same, if you like uh, Knit Picks needles or Knit Pro, I think they are in the UK, uh, and the Commonwealth, and um, what's the other brand? Knitter's Pride. These are Knitter's Pride needles, but they're all made by the same factory. In fact, these are Knit Picks cables. You can see the purple. And these are uh, Knitter's Pride tips. It's really funny because they say on their site, we cannot guarantee the fit of t our tips on other brands' needles. Whatever, it all <laughs> Dude, I know they're made in the same factory. They all fit. So that's what I'm, that's what I'm working on. I haven't been doing spinning in a while. I've just had too much other work stuff to do. Um, Let's see. So let's talk about, I got a, an email this week from Amba O'Brien, who is a Australian designer who creates really lovely, uh, ex really gorgeous accessible accessories. If you have not come across her, I definitely check her out. If you like knitting shawls and hats and other accessories, this is a, this, she would be a really, especially if you like two color shawls, definitely got to check out Amba O'Brien. She does really lovely stuff. And I had opened the pattern earlier and now it is telling me, no, you can't look at it. You have to re-download it. <laughs> so I guess that's what I will be doing currently. So she contacted me and said that she had just come out with a, a new collection. Uh, it's a three pattern collection called All Heart. And it is a, a shawl, a large shawl, uh, i.e. not a shawlette, and a, um, a cowl, 
and a scarf. And the scarf is fairly thick. I mean, you could think of it as, you know, kind of crossing over between a scarf and a stole. And they all use a, a heart-shaped lace motif that she designed herself. So, and but what I mean by that is, you know, a lot of designers use motifs they 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 take late they they take stitch patterns from existing stitch stitch dictionaries, um, but sometimes people will design color work or lace or cables or whatever themselves, which just kind of, I don't know kind of gives it an extra bit of cachet in my book. So here is this is the the front page of the collection, and again it's called the All Heart Collection, and. Um, you see nine pictures here, but those are variations on the three. They're, they're different samples of the same pattern. There are three patterns, as I mentioned. Okay, so here, let me find the pictures that I think will show up the best. This is the cowl, and you can see the heart-shaped lace motif there. Same motif, but interpreted into a triangular shawl. Gorgeous. And let's see which of these scarves is going to show up best. Probably this one. And then this is the scarf, and it has kind of a pointed tip at the end, and otherwise is is straight along the edge. And um, so each one of the patterns calls for. I'm just checking to make sure I'm right about this. I think they're all fingering weight. Is that correct? Yes. And she's knit them up in, you know, several different different versions so you can kind of see what the effect of using different kinds of, of yarn. Like she's got um, you know, a gradient used for one of the scarves. Here I'll show you what that looks like. This is a really cool way to use a gradient. And she's used uh, solids for most of them, but semi-solids and others. So, um, and yeah, different different sizes on the on the shawl, so that you actually you could wear one of them as a as a shawl. So really lovely collection. And I have to say, as a as somebody who does a lot of graphic design, I think Amba does a really nice job of. Look how gorgeous that page is. I mean, the piece is beautiful. But look at the attention to detail on the, just on the layout of the pattern itself. It's, that always says to me that, th this may not be entirely fair, but to me that always sends the signal that this person has really put a lot of care into the structure of this pattern. It is probably really well tech edited and tested and, um, and yeah, this person just really has a, an attention to detail that will, it means it's likely that I will enjoy the knitting experience. I'm definitely going to be knitting one of these. Probably, probably the cowl, actually, although I'm not much of a cowl person. Or maybe the scarf. I'm just, I'm not a big fan of triangular shawls. The kind of, the piece that says, look at my butt, is really not my, uh, not my cup of tea. <laughs> So a few other things about that collection. It is uh, it costs twelve fifty, and um, there is a knit along that just started and will be running through June fifteenth. And I will give you a link in the show notes. It is in her group, and um, she has a number of cool prizes for people who finish at least one project from the book. And uh, she also has a 20% discount code that is available in her group thread. So if you would like to use that, uh, just you know, follow the link that I'm going to give you to her, her thread and it will give you that code. And she is also very, has very kindly offered to give away two digital copies of the collection to viewers of the podcast. So I'm going to, if I can remember this time, <laughs> put up a, uh, a prize thread and I'm going to ask you to let us know which pattern you would plan to knit first and what you like about it. So that will, I don't know why I keep forgetting to put up the prize threads. I think it's just that I'm, there, there's so much involved with getting a podcast up, you know, typing, recording, planning it out, uh, 
getting everything together, recording the podcast, getting it uploaded, getting it squeezed down, um, you know, uploading it to iTunes, uploading it to YouTube, typing up the show notes, putting up the show notes into Ravelry and onto my... It's a lot, <laughs> is what I'm trying to say. And then I get to the end of all that, and it's just like, poof, the prize thread is like the last thing on my mind. So I hopefully will remember to do it this time, because I've yammered on enough about it that perhaps that will trigger some part of the aging brain. <laughs> Oh my gosh, have you seen, <sighs> on my birthday, which was last Friday, I turned 44 and I went to see While We Are Young, While We're Young, uh, with Ben Stiller and, oh my God. <laughs> it starts with an N, Naomi Watts. Wow. And uh, in the movie, Ben Stiller is, 44 and finds out that he has arthritis from his doctor and so it was just it's a real moment there my friend dina took me to see the movie and then we got caught in a hailstorm it was very exciting <laughs> wow i'm the queen of tangents today so take heart collection by ambo o'brien if you would like to win it please go to the prize thread let us know and i will pick two winners on the next episode of the podcast in two weeks time thank you Amba. So our last two things for today are a skein that says a lot about me and a technique segment. So to explain the skein that says a lot about me thing. Uh, so as you may remember last time on, on, last, on the last episode of the podcast, I posed a question to Nathan Taylor of the Sockmetician podcast, which has rapidly become one of my favorites. And... Um, he basically had a, well, he had a very interesting response to my question, which was to show us a skein that says a lot about you. So you should go watch it. Episode four, I think, is where he talks about this. Um, and it's very sweet. His his partner actually, his husband actually picked out the the skein that he thought said the most about Nathan because Nathan couldn't couldn't pick it himself. And then, which I was hoping he would do, he turned. You know, he said, "Now let me ask you a question." And then lamely asked me the same question back. No. No. Cop out. <laughs> okay, it is a good question. I will admit. And I'm happy to answer it. But dude, you gotta think of your own question next time. <laughs> I have another one for you as soon as I finish answering this one, so don't let me forget. Remind me, because I am 44 now. And things are falling apart. Okay, so here is, I, I somewhat reinterpreted the question. Well, no, I didn't. Because the original question was, um, show us a skein that either says a lot about you or, you know, kind of most represents you or something like that. See, I can't even remember what my own question was. So I started, I was realizing, yeah, this is kind of a hard question to answer. And I'm kind of fishing through my stash. And mostly I'm thinking, okay, basically what my stash says about me is that I buy lots of yarn to design things with and to knit things with, and then I just don't knit them. That seems to be the general message of my stash, which, you know, I suppose is kind of the general message of many stashes. And then I stumbled across this. And I realized that's the one right there. So let me explain what this is. And actually, there is a companion uh, partial skein. This has been partly used. That looks like this. As you may guess, these are hand spun. That barber pulling is kind of a classic sign, isn't it? And also, when you look at it closely, it's kind of a fuzzy, lumpy, bumpy mess. This is the very first hand spun that I ever made, and uh, so it is. It is close to my heart for that reason. But there's kind of more to the story than that. Uh, I. I made these, I wish I'd put a date on them. I did say what I dyed them with, about which, more in a moment. <laughs> Sorry. Nathan pointed out that I say that a lot, which is kind of funny. I never realized I said that a lot, but it's true. Funny little, funny little grammatically correct awkward constructions that I use. Anyways, 
uh, about, oh, maybe eight or nine, no, seven or eight years ago, I was just beginning to think about leaving my job as a professor. And, I, but I, I was tr still kind of thinking, well, maybe there's a way to kind of transform my job, transform what I do in my job to make it more what I want to do. I was just finding that the kind of standard history classes that I was teaching over and over again were not proving very satisfying to me. And there were lots of, th lots of reasons why I wanted to leave, but one of them I was thinking, you know, if I could just kind of take that like active, practical education that I really like that has to do with knitting. Like, you know, just, I really want to teach people how to make stuff. If I could somehow make that a part of my job as a history professor, <laughs> could I make that work? And I actually was, I was coming up with some decent ideas about how to do that. And one of them was that we have this, uh, we, Southwestern, where I used to teach, has a first-year seminar, which a lot of colleges have. It's basically a kind of um, interdisciplinary class that helps get first-year students acclimated to college learning. And, um, and ours were supposed to be very, very inter interdisciplinary. Like, they didn't want them to be a standard history class, in my case. It needed to be something that was, you know, really kind of touched on lots of different areas of inquiry. So I did a knitting class. The, as a first year seminar and uh, and do, taught it a couple of times and I loved it. I loved it so much. And it wasn't just teaching them how to knit, although that was part of it. It was also, we did a lot of reading about kind of issues that knitting raises. So we did some reading about the history of the industrialization of work, for example, and the kind of various disappearances and reappearances of handcraft and um, and women's work and we read about some of the psychological benefits of doing handwork, and we read about uh, some of the scientific research on the brain, how uh, you know memory and, and memory improves. Um, Alzheimer's is less likely if you are somebody who knits. So we just you know did a lot of uh, a lot of kind of interdisciplinary reading of, that about issues that knitting raises. So that was cool, but you know, I don't know. I was just, I was kind of flailing. And so a kind of as a research trip, it sounds so funny to say that now. <laughs> it's, it's always really a post-talk justification. I went to the John C. Campbell Folk School, which is in the n western tip of North Carolina. If you've ever seen the shape of North Carolina, it kind of descends down to a, a little tip and it was right there, kind of closer to Atlanta than really anywhere else big. And uh, it's a great school. It was founded in the 1930s, I think, as a way of preserving Appalachian crafts. Side note, coolest class at the John C. Campbell Folk School. They've got classes in all kinds of things, including blacksmithing, woodworking, quilting, cooking, I, polymer clay. I mean, pr practically anything that you can think of they've got that is craft, handcraft, they've got classes on it and great facilities for teaching it. So uh, one of the classes, because again, remember Appalachian based crafts, one of the classes is banjo making and kid you not, on the first day, I heard this as a report from someone else, didn't actually get to experience it myself. First day of banjo making, you walk in and there's a pile of dead gophers on the table. <laughs> So one of the, oh, somebody who had taken this class told me about it. And like, she didn't know that was going to happen. And she just walks in and she's like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> like, you're skinning the gopher. You, and you're going to like, strut, oh, yeah. You are making this banjo from the ground up, people. It's a great school. It's so great. They uh, teach you how to square dance. Or, or like the the kind of older version of square dancing. What do they call it? It's what they do in Jane Austen movies. 
That's what square dancing is based on, that same kind of... Anyways, what I went there for was a week long, all their classes are five days, five or six days or nine days. They're like a week or a weekend, a weekend. So I went for a week long class on natural dyeing and spinning. And mainly I went for the dyeing. That's what I thought I really wanted to do, but I actually really, really enjoyed the spinning too, even more than the dyeing. So it, it turned out to be a fantastic class. And the woman who taught it, whose name is Martha Owen, I think is her last name, is a, an artist in residence at the Campbell Folk School. So she regularly teaches classes. She has a sheep farm, a farm nearby that, and she raises sheep among other things. So the first day of class, no dead gophers, but she does walk in with a, uh, a newly shorn fleece Nothing else has happened to it other than some skirting and really nasty bits have been cut away. But that's it. Like it's, it's a raw fleece and we spent the week uh, cleaning it, which, I mean, basically she just put it in a washing machine, which granted is dedicated to the washing of fleece. Um, we ran it through, you know, some rinse cycles with some soap a few times. And, um, and then we pulled it apart into, you know, kind of big locks, and then we dyed it with natural dyes. So we did, uh, in this one, there is uh, matter, Osago orange bark. Oh, that's all that's in that one. There was, um, we also used cochineal bugs. They're these little uh, insects that uh, that live on cacti in South America and they make a very bright red color. That's what the red is in this one. We used onion skins and moss from the, the surrounding woods and uh, copper, all kinds of stuff. The copper, I think that green is from the copper that she had had soaking in a vinegar, I think. It's been a while, obviously. Um, so we, we dyed it and then we, um, and then we, oh gosh, my memory today, carded it with hand cards, carded. There were about 20 of us. We hand carded an entire fleece in probably about two days altogether, you know, interspersed with some, some dyeing, uh, carded it. Into, and you know, rolled up into roll eggs, uh, and then spun it, and plied it, and so I left that week with uh, three skeins of yarn that I had taken, well, collaboratively had taken from dirty fleece to finished skein of yarn in a week. So that was pretty cool. I have no idea what kind of sheep this is. I don't even think uh, Martha knows. <laughs> I think there was some Romney in here. It's a pretty, it's, it's definitely, you know, a pretty, a wooly, a wooly kind of uh, fleece. It's not, it's not super soft or anything, but it's, it was amazing. And the reason why I knew that's the one I wanted to pull out and how this all ties back into the queer thing is I just, it was a, a really defining moment where I just thought, yeah, I just want to do this. <laughs> I just want to make things and I'm going to figure out a way to make that work. Maybe it'll be at the university and maybe it won't, but one way or the other, this has got to be at the core of what I'm doing. I'm just tired of pretending like that's not true. I was just tired of being in my head all the time and spending a week doing this was yeah, it was just, it was a, a really pivotal moment for me. So there is my answer to your question. And now my new question for you is, I would like you to tell us about a pattern or a book that made you fall in love with knitting for the first time or all over again. So there's my question. Okay. 
uh, technique segment. So here is something that I learned the hard way. <laughs> And it's, you know, honestly, it's one of those lessons that I learned the hard way over and over again because I have a thick skull and a poor memory. Perhaps you do too. <laughs> so I was knitting away on a design thing that I can't show you. Uh, this is part of a, you know, a larger collection that I'm working on. It's a sweater, I will tell you that much. And I typically, you know how they always tell you with gauge that if you are going to knit something flat, knit the gauge swatch flat, and if you're going to knit it in the round, knit the gauge swatch in the round. And there are various ways to knit a gauge swatch in the round that, uh, you know, keep you, so that you don't have to do like a whole hat, basically, to get a good gauge swatch. Well, I've never really, for whatever reason, my gauge is pretty consistent. Like if I'm using the same needles with the same yarn, it really doesn't seem to matter whether I'm knitting flat, in the round, on DPNs, whatever, like I, if it's the same size needle, I tend to get the same gauge, which is great, right? I mean, I, I, it's nice that that is the case, because that's usually not the case. Also, my purl stitches are the same size as my knit stitches. For many people, that is also not the case. For my mom, for example, she has to, if she's knitting with, uh, she'll actually put on, on a circular interchangeable. She will put a smaller needle on the side that she purls with and a larger needle on the side that she's knitting with so that they'll be consistent. Uh, so never had this problem before and I'm knitting away on this sweater and knitted the body of the sweater on size sixes and so I was gonna knit the sleeve also in size sixes. So the body's knit in the round. The sleeve is also knit in the round but of course you know, unless you're going to do it on a nine inch needle, which I'm not, uh, I was doing it magic loop. So, or, you know, you could do DPNs or two circulars or whatever, but it's too small for most circular needles. So knitting away on this sleeve and I'm thinking, this is just looking kind of small, like not ridiculously small, but just a little small. And it's feeling a little more bulletproof than the sweater. Like the sweater was a little more drapey and the sleeve was feeling like, hmm, like a little stiff. I thought, Rrr. thankfully this is a, the, the sample I'm knitting at the moment is a kid size. It's a, like a six year old size. So not the end of the world. I was only about a third of the way into the sleeve and, you know, and again, like six year old size. So I was maybe, I don't know, like five inches in. So to the part, five inches into the part for the armhole. So I check the gauge and sure enough, it's completely off. Like the body of the sweater, I was getting five stitches to the inch and 26 rows, I think over four inches. And on the sleeve, I was getting five and a half, like completely off. Um, so body of the sweater 20 stitches over four inches sleeve 22 stitches over four inches big difference and, uh, and like 30 this was the problem was that I was also thinking okay I've done a lot of the increases and I should be like I should have a lot more sleeve than this and uh, yeah sure enough gauge was completely off so my tip for you this week see it all comes back around <laughs> despite all the blather. My tip for you this week is uh, if you are going to change, even if you're not changing needle sizes, you should recheck your gauge. Not necessarily re-knit a gauge swatch, because honestly, I'm not going to do that. A sleeve is a decent gauge swatch. Like, I would just go ahead and start knitting the sleeve, but once I got about three inches in, I would check again, just to make sure even if everything seemed to be going okay, because um, a couple of things can make your gauge change. One of them being that just changing the method, like I wasn't, I didn't change the needle size, but I was now knitting magic loop instead of regular in the round. Um, even the material of the needle can change, can, changing the material of the needle can change your gauge. So if you switch from bamboo to, to metal, for instance, that can make a difference. 
Um, also, if a lot of time has gone by between when you made one piece and when you pick it up and start knitting again, that can also make a difference. My gauge has loosened up over time. So, yeah, it's been said before, it'll be said again, and we'll all just continue to ignore it. <laughs> but uh, every once in a while, especially on a big project, probably ought to recheck the gauge it from somebody who didn't do it the first time. All right, but note is that, I mean, you know, whatever. I have to knit back, look, rip back about five inches of knitting. Not really that big a deal. So I believe that is about it for this week. I have mm, about an hour and 15 minutes to clean up the house and get dinner started before my guests get here. <laughs> I'm not making anything too complicated. It's, uh, what am I making? Cucumber soup and, uh, oh, a Mediterranean pizza. My friend is, uh, she works on North African immigration into France, the history of that. And uh, so I thought it'd be cool, especially because it's getting really warm here. It's it's already in the 80s and some days even in the 90s. So it uh, just seemed like a good Mediterranean kind of style food. Seemed like a good, a good theme. So the Mediterranean pizza has lamb and tomatoes and stuff on it. Okay, now I'm hungry. <laughs> you can find me online at uh, darkmatternits.com, which is where you will find the show notes. And there is also a Ravelry group called Dark Matter Knits. And I'm just Dark Matter Knits everywhere. Darkmatternits at gmail.com is my email address. I am Dark Matter Knits on Ravelry, Instagram, etc., etc. 